back to another Token Punch Lunch. I've got a lot of segments lined up for you from my contributors, and uh, they have also, as normal, done a very good job at putting their segments together. So a lot of interesting stuff, a lot of uh, neat things to go through. And so uh, let's go ahead and get down to it. Thanks for joining us. Let's hit it. Hi, this is Ambie from Board Game Blitz. And when this episode of Token Punch Lunch airs, I'm actually going to be at BGGCon. So today I'm gonna to talk to you about board game conventions and share with you some convention tips that I do. Board game convention season for this year is pretty much over, but you can always start planning for next year. One thing that's really important to do with bigger conventions is plan ahead. Especially if the convention is not local to you, you'll need to buy airplane tickets and buy tickets to the convention because those can sell out early. So, you need to buy airplane tickets, hotel tickets, and convention tickets, and make sure you have all those plans figured out well ahead of time so that you are less stressed when the convention actually happens. I tend to like gaming conventions where there's a lot of open gaming and you can play a lot of games. So I like conventions with big libraries, with new games and old games that I haven't played and I get to try. For some people, you might like scheduling your time at the convention. Lots of conventions have scheduled events or games that you can sign up for ahead of time, and then you can fill your calendar with that. I prefer leaving my schedule open and just walking around and finding an open table or finding a game to play when I feel like it. A lot of the open gaming conventions I go to have flags or signs for players wanted, which means you put it up on your table indicating that you want players to come and play your game. So these are really useful for getting people to play a game, and you could meet new people using it. If you have open time and want to play a game, you can wander around the main hall and look for players wanted signs, and you can just join in on a game, which is really neat. If you're a shyer person like me, you might not be comfortable going up to strangers to play a game. So I always bring my husband along with me to conventions, so if you have a friend that you can bring with you, then you can go with them to play games and it's easier for you to meet new people if you're with someone else. If your goal is to try out a bunch of new games, a lot of times the convention has a list of the games in their library on their website. So ahead of time you can check to see what games are in the library and make a list of what games you want to try out. One really important thing to keep in mind when you're at a convention is to stay hydrated and eat enough. If you're playing games all day, you might forget to eat, so make sure you take breaks for eating snacks or eating meals, and I like to bring a water bottle around with me. In fact, I like carrying a backpack around because it can carry some games that I have, any games that I buy at the convention, and my water bottle and some snacks. A lot of convention centers have water refill stations, so you can bring a water bottle and fill it up, and then you can have it with you all the time. There are so many different things to do at conventions, so depending on what your goal is and what you like doing, your convention experience could be completely different from mine. But the main important thing to keep in mind at a convention is to have fun. So whatever you like doing, do that. And make sure you get enough rest so that you can enjoy your awake time at the convention. So are you planning for any board game conventions in the future? And what do you like doing at conventions? Let me know in the comments. Hey everybody, it's Jay, and it's time to talk about your flair. On 15 pieces of flair, I'm going to show you all some ways to spruce up that game room. Now, I'm going to change the format a little bit for this episode, because anytime I make um, anything that uses a custom vinyl decal or like a, a paper stencil or whatever for my projects, almost guaranteed I get asked where do I get the um, vinyl decal or the paper stencil or whatever it is I'm using and what's really going on is we cut them ourselves my wife cuts them all for me um, and that's how we get them so I'm gonna show you how I make them what is actually being done is I use what's called a Cricut cutting machine it can cut anything that's like real thin paper cardboard fabric vinyl any of that kind of stuff and you can make stuff like this out of it like custom meeples or or logos or, or whatever so I'm gonna show you guys how I do it all you're gonna need is the Cricut cutting machine um, the vinyl or the paper or whatever the sticky mat that comes with it and a computer so let's check it out first you find what you want to make your uh, vinyl or paper stencil or decal out of and make a black silhouette JPEG in Photoshop out of it. 
Now we're going to be doing a meeple for this example, but you can do pretty much whatever you want, like your favorite Pokemon, or like some goofy dude's face. Then, using a program called Surecuts a lot too, we'll open up that JPEG, and in this case, we're going to do some meeples. Now, this is a preset family of them that we have saved, but we're only going to cut one of these out for my buddy Derek Funkhauser. Then, we'll apply the vinyl to the sticky cutting mat and load it into the Cricut. Then you just press the cut button and it'll do its thing. Then once it's done, go ahead and unload the mat from the Cricut, then cut off and peel off all the excess. Now these Cricuts also come with preset cartridges with predetermined stencils on them like this cupcake cartridge, and they also come with button overlays to make all that stuff easier. Now my wife also has this cheat sheet for all the presets, so if you're cutting paper, vinyl, fabric, or whatever, you're going to have to change the depth, the speed, and the pressure accordingly, and this cheat sheet makes all that stuff really easy. Well, boom, there you have it. A quick and easy way to add some flair to your game room or your car like these meeples. Um, I got a set of five of these on my car for my family. But that's how my wife is cutting all of these vinyls and, and paper stencils and decals for this show. Um, I feel like she probably does more than this show or more for this show than I do because I feel like I use these dang things for like every other episode. So I think she might be doing more than me for this whole show because like without her, I wouldn't be able to do that really. So thanks, Karen. Now, if you guys see me doing something that you like to do and you're like, where do I get that at? Because I want to make something for myself. Do like what my buddy Sam Erickson did. He reached out to me. He asked where I got those Nuka-Cola vinyls so he can make his own Nuka-Cola caps. And he just got a hold of me. I cut them for him. I sent them to him. And now he's making his own for his game room. And he's actually making a Nuka-Cola quantum cap, which is way cooler than what I did. I wish I would have thought of that. But... Just like him, if you see me doing something, you want something to make for yourself, get a hold of me and I'll cut it for you. Or if you want some meeples for your car or whatever, get a hold of me for that too. I'll, I'll cut them for you. So don't hesitate to do that. Now if any of you all have suggestions on games or ideas you'd like me to make into some flair, leave them in the comments below or find me anywhere on social media. And don't forget everybody, 15 pieces of flair is the bare minimum. Some people choose to do more and we encourage that. And this actually does count as six, so you should be good there too. Hey gamers, this is Liz Davidson from Beyond Solitaire, and I'm here to bring you another episode of Solo Thrash. A mere thrush gaming for those of us who like to game alone. Except Thanksgiving's coming up, and that means a lot of time with family. So maybe you won't be gaming entirely alone. Here are a few games that you can solo, but that might be enticing enough to lure in members of your family to try them with you. My first recommendation for a solo game that you can expand to be cooperative with your family is actually Mice and Mystics. Now, those of you who know me know that Mice and Mystics is not actually one of my favorite board games. However, it is very appealing to kids, and it's just got such a friendly red wall, watership down kind of vibe to it that I think it's easier to get other people to try a simple dungeon crawl if it has a cute little storyline and fun miniatures the way that Mice and Mystics does. The second game I'd recommend luring your friends and family to play with you is Street Masters Rise of the Kingdom. And the reason that I recommend this one is that I have a lot of strong childhood memories of playing video games with my little brother, including games like Double Dragon. Street Masters, designed by the Sadler brothers, is something that's deeply inspired by their own experiences of playing to together as kids, of loving video games, and of having a good time just thrashing some bad guys with your favorite people in your life. So if you have a copy of Street Masters and you have some friends who are at least board game curious, I recommend that you give it a shot because you'll have a great time trying to whoop up on the bad guys together. 
Or if you want to play with friends or family who aren't necessarily into things like video games or fantasy mice, you can always try to solo Flashpoint Fire Rescue around them and then try to lure them to play. Because who doesn't like and respect firemen and think that they're cool? Together as a group, Flashpoint Fire Rescue lets you team up to rescue people from a burning house and also to rescue dogs and cats. I mean, it's it's just a feel-good thing when you succeed. And even if you fail, fortunately, it's just a game. So you have hopefully gotten some people in your family and friend groups into a new hobby. So these are my three recommendations for games that you can play solo when you just are whiling away Thanksgiving afternoon and everybody's taking a nap. But I'm also sort of hoping that they would be alluring enough to help you get your friends and family in on the best hobby that there is. Happy gaming. Our supporters voted on it, so today on Rook and Record, we are getting sugary sweet with My Little Scythe. And this game is so colorful, so poppy, so adventurous, and so tied to our sense of adult longing for a childhood that has long gone by that I couldn't help but go with Weezer. In their 1994 debut album, commonly known as Blue, Weezer perfectly encapsulated 90s distortion-addled indie rock, relying on bright chords, simple structure, and listful lyrics both declarative and melancholy. Weezer captured the raw complexities of youth. And here's the thing about My Little Scythe is, yeah, it's a family game meant to be played with kids, but it's also the distillation of a multifaceted strategy game bursting with systems and nuance, and that's kind of like this album, which takes all of the things that made the early 90s rock music so experimental and raw and filters them through a childish lens. Every single song on Blue is an earworm, instantly familiar and catchy, and yet the underpinnings are dynamic and rich. These adventurous tracks are perfect for scouring palms, seeking and collecting resources, delivering goods, fighting with pies, and completing quests with each of your awesome little critters. Like this game, which is equal parts innovation and adaption of the things that came before, Blue is vibrant, ambitious, and just plain fun. So that's why it is the perfect album for you to listen to while playing My Little Side. Thanks for all you saw. Thank you so much for watching the Cardboard Herald's Rook and Record. I've been Jack, and remember that the more that we do of these, the less bad music you will have to suffer at the table. Folks, welcome back to another accessorize segment here on Token Punch Lunch. Today we're going to be taking a look at a couple of different accessories that you may or may not be able to get a hold of. And the reason I'm sharing these things with you is because uh, I don't know about how accessible they are, but if they are at all accessible and you like the game Village Attacks, then you should go out and purchase these because it will enhance your experience with the game that much more. So let's go ahead and get down to the table and show you what I'm talking about. So first of all, as we look at some of the accessories that you can currently get for Village Attacks, you see the dice that are out here. Now these are the dice that come in the game, uh, just regular old black dice and then uh, there's a uh, Village uh, movement dice and uh, or spawning dice and then a nighttime dice as well. Uh, these are the ones that come in the game. And then now you can uh, purchase, I believe they're available, they were available at Essen for sale and uh, you can get all of these other custom sets of dice with the different colors uh, that you can have. You have the uh, mythic dice over here, the arcane dice over here, the demon dice right here, and then the cursed dice. The only set that I don't have showing are the ones for the uh, undead dice and they're a green set uh, that I that I don't have just yet, but I'm going to be getting it probably. Anyway, uh, you can get uh, all of these, and this is just a way for you to spruce up your time instead of everybody having to pass around these six dice. They each have their own set of dice that uh, you can uh, keep with you uh, during the course of the game. Then they also have a exclusive a Kickstarter exclusive set that I'm not really going to spend too much time on because uh, I don't know how available this one is. 
This was specifically a Kickstarter exclusive. Um, I believe that these uh, are being sold separately right now. So those are the dice. And then another thing that you might be able to pick up uh, on the market somewhere is this acrylic token set that apparently on this uh, on this case it says that it's limited edition only at Spiel uh, 2018. However, I don't know if that's completely uh, honest or not if they have any left or if they're going to be selling them on their website or whatever it might be but uh, this was done in conjunction with Blackfire and uh, they are uh, these acrylic tokens that you can uh, have now you see that one side is kind of dimmed out you have uh, all of the uh, entry tokens uh, that are like this on both sides and they have the little uh, standees otherwise you just you know these uh, cardboard tokens you just put them down uh, and they sit flat on the board, but uh, these little uh, acrylic standees uh, have a little bit more pop to them. You also have the uh, experience tokens over here, uh, the cardboard ones, and then the acrylic ones over here. Uh, now, they have this film on them, and that is the one thing about this part, this uh, accessory that I don't really like that much, and it's, it's this film that you have to kind of uh, take off, and it's rather tedious to get it off of there. You have to kind of use your fingernails or some other kind of thing there and uh, just get it started and then once you have that started it should just come right off if you can get oh man my little <laughs> my fingers are not very good for this but it pulls right off like this and then it has that really nice crisp image on both sides like that but you have to not only do it to that but you also have uh, two sides on this as well pulling that off. But anyway, these uh, little acrylic tokens, they just uh, each individual thing has to be peeled off if it bothers you that much. It, it may be that you just don't really care that it's there, but uh, each each one has to be uh, has to have that film removed. And now you can see that it has uh, the difference there of the two. So maybe that's going to be a big thing for you. The other side, the three side is you don't have to take anything off of that, but that's the uh, acrylic tokens. And uh, those acrylic tokens also come with uh, the uh, different uh, tokens that are used in the bag in the game. And I've already removed all the film off of these so that they are very uh, you know, crisp on both sides. But uh, each of these things, these are the ones that you fill out to uh, determine what kind of uh, uh, town hero comes out of the bag. So uh, there you have it. That's the acrylic tokens. So that's that for another accessorize segment. I certainly hope you've enjoyed it. Now, I think that you can get the dice. I think that is absolutely uh, available. I don't know exactly where, so you have to do some searching about that, I think. But uh, the acrylic tokens may or may not be available. Maybe you'll find them on the market, aftermarket or post-market, whatever you call that. But uh, maybe they'll probably be a little bit too expensive if they're on the uh, secondary market. I don't know. Uh, uh, but anyway, I wanted to let you know that these things existed so that you could hit the ground running, so to speak, and go check out to see if they're available. I think the dice at least will be, I don't know. Check it out. Let's get back to the rest of your lunch. Hi, everybody. I'm Jana, and I'm almost a gamer. And I've been thinking lately how much fun it is playing games. And on occasion, how great it feels when you win a game. So I've realized that there are some games that I do really well at. I'm just great at them and I tend to win a lot. But then there's a whole lot of other games that I do the opposite. I hardly ever win. I usually come in like second to last or so. And it's made me think some more, like why are there specific games that I can excel at and other games I can't? It's been a little difficult putting my finger on it. And then that made me remember, I'm dyslexic. When I was younger, I couldn't read on my own and I hated math really just struggled in school and it wasn't until I was a teenager that I was diagnosed with dyslexia. This like changed my world because up until that point I saw myself as someone who was dumb and people would just tell me I was lazy and didn't work hard enough in school. So to learn that my brain was actually working differently and processing information differently than other people really changed everything and I realized that 
I had to learn how to cope and that I would eventually learn how to read and achieve in academics, and I did. I learned how to read phonetically. I graduated from college at the top of my class. It was an art college, but still pretty cool. And I have to say, I haven't really thought about dyslexia as something that was a problem in my life for a really long time until I started gaming. Now there are all sorts of ways that dyslexia plays out in my life. For example, I really struggle with spelling, so a game like Scrabble isn't really my jam. Uh, but on the other hand, there are different factors that kind of crop up. For example, I really struggle with keeping multiple facts and figures in my head all at one time. And I also struggle with logic. <laughs> I always think of really creative answers, while other people, like my husband, is very logical. The logical answers take a little bit longer for me to get to. And that's because of being dyslexic. I tend to favor the right side of my brain over the left side. The left side is designated to reading, writing, logical, and analytical thought, while the right side is designated to creative fields like art and music, um, holistic thinking, and intuitive thought. So they're very different. That's why dyslexics tend to um, struggle with reading because they tend to use the right side of their mind for processing words and even like figures and whatnot. And the right side of the brain is not good at retaining um, large amounts of information. It's not good at keeping it on easy recall uh, to look back upon and analyze. So games that require analytical deduction like Sleuth are really difficult for me. And a game like even Memoir 44 that, re that really involves tactical strategy is not something that I can excel at. I still enjoy these games and I <laughs> do my darndest, but my husband definitely has a foot above me because he is more left-brained. So in doing a little bit of research on dyslexia recently, I learned that it affects one in five people, which is mind-boggling to me because when I was growing up, I felt like I was the only one. So it kind of opened my eyes and being a somewhat of a gamer now, um, it's been interesting to me to see how differently my brain works. While there are games that I struggle to excel at, there are great games that come very naturally to me and I do wonderfully at, like games that involve pattern recognition, like Flatline or um, even Sangrata, code names, and then other games that involve like creative puzzle solving, like number nine, uh, games that are more holistic in theme and also in presentation. For example, Concordia is a game I recently learned and I find extremely intuitive for my learning style and I love that game. I would love to hear from other dyslexic gamers, what are the games that you enjoy and why? I think it would be really encouraging for each other just to kind of know what games are out there that do play to a dyslexic brain. So I just want to encourage any younger gamers out there that have dyslexia, I know what it feels like when everyone else is excelling at what you find extremely difficult, like learning how to read and math. And I just want you to know that there are a lot of games out there that will play to your abilities and will be able to highlight and showcase your strengths, like the creative puzzle solving and pattern recognition and intuitive thought, like all of these things can come through in a variety of games. So don't be afraid to try them. You may be amazed at your abilities. There is a whole lot of potential for people in the creative fields. We need creative thinkers out there. So just know that you do have value and you do have potential. And just one more note, um, if you are not dyslexic and uh, you may be playing with someone who you don't really know very well, just bear this video in mind. There are those gamers who struggle with analysis paralysis. There's also quite a few gamers out there that have dyslexia and maybe just read and process information slower than you do. Just a thought to bear in mind the next time you're playing with a new gamer. So. 
Is this something that you can relate to? Would you like to see some more segments about dyslexic gaming? Let me know in the comments. I would love to hear from you. I hope everybody has an awesome day and thanks for watching the Token Punch Lunch. Hello fellow Token Punch Lunchers. This is Paweł Kaczmarek from Geek Factor speaking, talking to you about all the things Poland, Polish and Polonese centered, just to give you an insight into our board gaming community and board gaming market here in Poland. Now, today I want to talk to you about my favorite Polish designers. Now, obviously, I can't talk to you about all the Polish designers that I like because of all the because of the time constraints. So I'm gonna I broke it down to the top five Polish designers that I wanted you to know. These are just my top five favorite. I'm not saying those five are the best. This is a personal top five. Starting with number five is Jarosław Biliński. Now, he may be unknown to you guys yet, but he is quite well known already here in Poland. He made games such as Wizards Towers. Uh, quite recently, he finished a, a crowdfunding campaign for Junk Tech, but he has an even bigger game that he finished even before that, and that is coming quite soon to Kickstarter, and that is Guardians of Xobos. And it's mainly Guardians of Xobos why I included him on this list, because this game really impressed me. This is like a modern time, uh, like a real time strategy game, uh, Com like brought down to a board game, which is like a very difficult thing to do, but it's, it's made in a way that makes sense. And I know he's got a bunch of projects in the works. He's very passionate. I mean, he is so passionate. He's one of those people you don't call unless you have an hour to spare because he's going to talk to you about every single project he has in the works. And that is actually, I mean it in the, po the most positive way possible. This is just to show how passionate he is about what he makes. Number four. Now, this is a bit of a cheat because I'm including two people in this place, on this spot, but this is a duo and they've always designed games together. And those people are Viola Kijowska and Marcin Robka. Just one of the nicest couples I have, have ever had the good fortune of meeting. Really nice people and really clever designers. I mean, we've had a great time playing their, such their games as Take a Train or, for example, Alien Artifacts, a game you might have heard of or coming real soon, Solar City. Very clever designs, very neat designs. So I also, have a, I also know about a few games they have in the works, which makes me even more excited about putting them at number four. Number three, Adam Kwapiński. Now, Adam Kwapiński is a designer who's been working in the business in Poland for quite some time now. And I've always, there was a certain point where I, I had heard of him, but I never actually played any of his games. And I was like, yeah, I know Adam Kwapiński, I know this guy. And then like within three or four months, I played in between Lords of Hellas, Nemesis. And I just fell in love with this guy. I mean, seriously, also one of the nicest per people you will ever meet, but such an insanely clever guy. He's a very, very smart and by very, very smart, I strictly mean his IQ is so high and he devotes so much of that IQ and his energy and his time into designing those games. Number two, Michał Oracz. Michał Oracz, well, Niroshima Hex, Theseus, The Dark Orbit, This War of, My, of Mine, The Edge Downfall, and Monolith Arena. Do I need to say anything more? <laughs> I mean, seriously, this guy is, uh, I don't know, there's just something about his designs that are, that just pop, that are just full of like energy, they're very dynamic, there's very little downtime usually in his games. It's just, it's just an amazing person. I look forward to every single one of his designs and I simply can't wait what he's gonna come up with next. This is Michał Oracz, uh, my number two. And number one, my favorite designer, Ignacy Trzewiczek. His Robinson Crusoe Adventure on the Cursed Island is my favorite game of all time and has been for quite some, quite some time. I just love how, I, I, whenever I think of a game that has like a, a good, neat, clean design, mechanically speaking, and the wonderful story, a theme on top of it that actually works and makes you feel the theme. It just, I, it's hard for me to find a better game than Robinson Crusoe who does the, the, which does that. So just kudos, just, and on this game alone, I could actually place him on number one. But Imperial Settlers, uh, 51st State, Master Set, um, uh, Detective, obviously, Detective, his newest design. I mean, those are all great games and th those are the type of games that I just love going back to every now and then. So those are my top five favorite designers. Like I said, these are only five that I actually named, but there are a lot more working in Poland that show huge promise. So this is just, this is just to show you what an incredible amount of talent 
we have here in Poland. Uh, I hope you like the list and if you want to you can obviously uh, put down in the comment below what your favorite uh, Polish designers are or maybe I surprised you with some of those titles you weren't even aware that those were designed by Polish people. In any case, thank you very much for watching, thank you Sam for inviting me to be a part of Token Punch Lunch and see you next time, bye! Hey, hey, welcome to Token Punch Lunch. My name is Bobby, and this is these Totally Geeky Games, where I make recommendations of games for those geeky friends of ours with interests outside of our hobby. Our hobby being tabletop board and card games, and the interest this week being the Harry Potter franchise. With the release of Fantastic Beasts 2, Crimes of Grindelwald, uh, coming soon. I wanted to talk about some games that you could recommend to people that are fans of this world, this universe, these characters, uh, this theme um, specifically. The first game that I would recommend is perhaps the most obvious of them all, but hey, why kind of deviate from the obvious if it really works well? Uh, it's Harry Potter. I believe the full title is Harry Potter Hogwarts adventure deck building game i don't know a picture will flash up and correct me if i'm wrong but anyway the harry potter deck building game is a fantastic and, game uh, it works well at a gateway level uh because the game is separated into seven kind of books or parts and the first couple just serve to teach you um how to play the game and as you keep going you start uncovering harder and harder villains from, yes, the subsequent books in the series, because there's seven of them. Um, and it's a deck building game. It's a cooperative deck building game. Um, any fan of the Harry Potter series will really have fun playing this game, I think. I did want to recommend two other games that came out around the same time. And maybe this subgenre was kind of exploding this whole magical kids going to school to learn to become witches and wizards. And both of them kind of have the same theme. Uh, but I did want to make these two other recommendations because both of these games work very well at the gateway level. The first one is Potion Explosion. Potion Explosion, um, pun non intended, I guess, made a big explosion when it came out. A lot of people were talking about this game. Um, and it's basically a game where you get a... Um, you build a contraption with a Ikea style rule book kind of thing. Anyway, you assemble this attract contraption that uh, feeds marbles through tracks and um, you pull marbles to try to concoct your different potions to pass the exam and you're trying to kind of set off chain reactions. It's a really fun game and it's really pretty on the table and it's always fun to play with those marbles anyway. So really great components. I would recommend this game to anybody. Another game that I would recommend that I think kind of flew under the radar, although it came out around the same time, um, is Arcane Academy. Arcane Academy is a Kevin Wilson and Eric Lane game. I'm not as familiar with this particular IP that they used. It was an anime, but... As far as I know, the story of the game is kind of the same thing. You're students at some kind of wizarding academy, and you're trying to pass a test to become a great wizard or a witch. Anyway, if you have any friends, or if you yourself are a fan of the Harry Potter franchise, any of these games would work, and any of these games would work out really well. Um, so let me know if I've missed any. What games would you recommend? Anyway, until next time, my name is Bobby, and this has been These Totally Geeky Games on Token Punch Lunch. Hey everyone, this is Tim Jen at the Metal Meeple, and this is the Budget Board Game Breakdown. So in this episode, we're going to do something slightly different. We're going to take a look at a standard deck of playing cards. Now obviously you probably are familiar with these. You can play lots of games such as poker. You can play you know, blackjack and all that stuff. You can actually do some basic magic tricks. But in this video, we're going to take a look at what you can use with a standard deck of 52 playing cards, possibly adding in the jokers to proxy games that you may not have on you at the time or games that you want to try out. So I've got a couple of them on this list that I'm going to go over. There's plenty of them out there that you can do, but this is just my picks. One, uh, and again, I'm not going to go over the rules, but I am going to tell you kind of how you would proxy them. So one is get bit. And get bit with a four, uh, with a basic deck of playing cards, you can play four players. 
just give a one to seven out to each player. Each player puts a king out as them, and you have the joker or something else to represent the shark. And there you go, you have get bit. If you want to add a second deck, you could and have more players. Uh, we have Brave Rats and Love Letter. These are probably the only two that I would recommend having maybe a picture of the rules references for the different classes and stuff like that on a phone, or maybe each player download that onto their phone to, to, to have in front of them. Otherwise, you can play it with just a deck of cards, especially Love Letter. You know, you got the two through eight. I would not use the king and queen uh, as they are, but use the two through eight as the numbers are in Love Letter. And with the guards, just use any five face cards for the guards. And then for the scoring, you can actually use the leftover cards and just pile them in front of each player. Agent Hunter is a game I've talked about on this budget board game breakdown before. In this, each player just gets one through nine, and you're trying to guess what cards they have in front of them. Three of them go face down in front of them. It has some tokens, but you can pretty much use any of the extra cards for that purpose. We have Skull, and Skull has been talked about before in this manner. Snakes and Lattes had talked about it on Board Game Breakfast a couple of years ago. I don't remember how they quite did it, but basically... Uh, you would give each player like three red cards and a black card, probably a face card. Now, the only problem with that is if you play it multiple times or like longer games, people are going to determine maybe card count what you have. So if you have like a four, five, and six of diamonds in, the, in your face card, but your skull gets removed, one turn you play a four, the next turn you play the five and six, they might be able to card count you and know what you have left. So keep that in mind, but it is typically not going to happen, and you're probably not going to play it a lot if it's proxied anyway. Uh, the last two games are social games. We got two rooms and a boom. You can do this with a standard deck of playing cards. Uh, probably less rules intensive as far as the special characters go, but you just have a black team, red team, and the kings would represent the president and the bomber. And then you can use the jack and the uh, queens as maybe other special characters. Probably wouldn't go too far with that without having the actual game because there's tons of characters, tons of rules or whatever. So, And lastly, you can play the resistance using a deck of cards. Simply give each player a red or black at the beginning to determine their loyalty. And then past that, you would give each player a red or black card to vote with. But when it comes time to do the missions, you do want to shuffle up the rest of the black and red cards and have them uh, give uh, give them out to each player in the quest or mission or whatever uh, to cast into that pile because you don't want somebody always given the the four of diamonds as a fail card because you're going to be able to determine who it is. But anyway, that's a bunch of games you can uh, check out. Uh, you can check out a geek list called the Master List of Games playable with a modified or standard deck of playing cards. It's Geek List Item One Four Three Six Nine. So if you go to Board Game Geek slash uh, board, uh, geek list slash one four three six nine. You can also check out that list there. And I'm gonna leave you with one other thing: a simple trick that you can perform and impress your friends. You're gonna use a standard 52 deck of playing cards, and you're gonna give it a shuffle in front of your spectators so they know that you don't have the deck set up or anything. Give it a little bit of cuts, and then you're ready. So what you're gonna do is pile these in piles of 13 points. The first card is worth the value, so this is four five or each card after that's one point so four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen uh let's just do it like this to make it a little more interesting three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen nine ten eleven twelve thirteen eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen and then you can do jack queen king so it's thirteen and the last three cards you can't do anything with. Now, at this point, you're going to ask the spectators, and you can turn your back to them at this point and have them do it. They want to flip over three decks and take the rest of the cards and put them in a pile face up. Now, you're going to take these cards, and you're going to put the other ones out in the middle, and you're going to ask them to start flipping over a card from each deck, but only two of them. So we'll flip over this one. We will flip over this one. And then you're going to ask them what the value is of this card that's face down. You can take guesses or whatever, but in the end, you can tell somebody if they're right, if they got it right. Otherwise, you're going to say, this is a six. And you reveal it, and it sure is a six. The way you do that, though, let's flip these back over. Up until this point, the game, or the, the, the trick is fine. You're going to have all those cards that you got face up, and then you're going to count out 10 under the table. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Have them flip over a card. Another 1, 2, 3. Flip over another card. Another 1, 2, 3, 4. And it helps if you're fast at this, otherwise they might get suspicious. 
And then whatever you have left, one, two, three, four, five, six, is gonna be the final card. And the math always works out. So there you go, there is a trick that you can impress your friends with. It's super easy, it does not take any setup, and it's infallible as long as you can count properly. So anyway, if you have any questions, feel free to email me at timjeanette at gmail.com, follow me on social media, check out my podcast, MeepleCore, and let us know down below what games have you proxied with a deck of cards. Till next time, keep on rocking and rolling dice. 323 to 584. Adam Young. 1955. Okay. Do you remember the story of the little person who took the very important item into the depths of the bad guys? And it was a big, epic struggle. And there were monsters, and there were bad guys, and it was good versus evil, and there was magic. If you're thinking about Lord of the Rings, that is not the game that I'm thinking about today. The game that we'll be playing is Willow, directed by Ron Howard. The forgotten copy, the forgotten stepchild of Lord of the Rings. If you are a fan of Willow the movie, directed by Ron Howard, then I will highly recommend this game for you. It will be one that you will absolutely enjoy. The whole point of the movie Willow is that Will Oofgood will be taking the baby Alora Danit and needs to find someone who can take care of him. Unfortunately, Willow comes across Mad Mardigan. And that's the first person. Would you trust your child with Val Kilmer? Willow, in good conscience, does not. So he goes along with Mad Mardigan. But a potion gets put on him, and he falls in love with Princess Sorsha. I never recommend falling in love with Val Kilmer! Unfortunately, Princess Sorsha is the daughter of the bad guy. No, not this guy. So what they'll be doing is they'll be walking to their location that they need to go to with the baby unless bad guys show up. If the bad guys show up, they will cast spells, and then they will battle using their prowess by rolling a six-sided die. And if you're able to fight them off, you will take the total amount, subtract from the total amount of the other person, and that's how much damage you will take. The bad guys are trying to take the baby and knocking down Mad Mart again and going up here to their castle, and that's how they win the game. Well, the bad guy, or the good guys, will fight back and try to take the baby from the bad guys and either reach their location with the specter, which is a treasure, or they can also go to the castle of the bad guy and defeat them. You will do so by moving around this board, boop, 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 possibly falling in love, but definitely, definitely making friends. Willow is actually one of those games that will surprise you at the end of the day. You look at this game and you'll think this is 1980s stuff, but what you're going to get is actually a pretty good storytelling game. A lot of the mechanics and mechanisms of the game seem to be very modern. Of course, you're going to be down to a die roll at times for combat, but you'll be adding in your cards to mitigate that. You cannot just run in and fight the main bad guy. You have to build your characters up, with spells and weapons and armor in order to take her on. The game has a unique perspective that it follows loosely along with the movie, so you actually feel like those things that occurred in the movie are happening, like Mad Mardigan is tied up when the game starts. But it allows you to make decisions, and those decisions allow you to play forth a game that isn't a slave to the movie. This is what we want on a game based on an IP. We have a jumping off point, we have an ending point, but what happens in the middle is up to the players. That is a great thing to do, and this game did it 30 years ago. For a game based on a popular IP, and I'm using popular in the most general of senses here, I would say that Willow is a game you should go back in time and check this game out. It will be a really fun game that plays up to six players. Yes, I said six players that you can have around this board and have a good time reliving that great movie of Willow. This game, at the end of the day, gets off scot-free. This is a game I'd recommend you going back and trying out, especially if you want a light adventure game that plays six people without a tremendous amount of downtime.
Hi, we're Board Game Opinions. My name's Jonathan Hicks. I'm Steve Rain. And I'm Mark Winnell. And today we're doing our hotness video for the month, uh, which is essentially which game we want to play right now more than any other game. So it's not necessarily a game that we own. It might be something that hasn't come out yet that we're hotly anticipating. Or it might be something that we've played loads, but still really want to play it again because we've fallen in love with it. Um, so we're each going to pick a game, uh, which is the one we really want to play the most now. My one is Brass of the Birmingham Edition, because I'm loving it. Uh, it's an economic Euro, which I like, but the thing I love most about it is just the sheer amount of play interaction. I know Black Brass was already a popular, but I prefer the Birmingham Edition slightly. It's got a bit more gamerish to know, I think Jonathan said, because it's got more randomization in the way it plays out. Not too random, but just enough to change the game a bit more. And ultimately, because I always care what everybody else is doing, I'm always in engaged whether it's a two-hour game. That's really good for me. I Go yeah, I like the art of the new one. I mean, I, I played the um, Lancashire version, I think, yeah, uh, yeah. but the art on both of them, the new the new editions of them, is uh, is really good. It's a lot less bland than the original, I believe. Yes, the artwork is really nice. Uh, the theme doesn't really grab me. It's like industrial England or something, isn't it? But actually, the game is really engaging. I've been surprised just how much I've enjoyed it. Looking at it, it doesn't. You wouldn't think it would be that much fun, but it's as you say, it's very interactive. Mm. You got to look at each other a lot. Uh, my hotness this month is, I've got it out here, is uh, Undertone, which is the expansion to Too Many Bones. Now, Too Many Bones is in my top 10 games of all time. I love playing this game. I played it loads and loads with my son. We've had a great time. Um, but the expansion, I kickstarted it uh, last year, so it's just arrived, and we haven't played it yet. So <laughs> me and my son sort of unwrapped all the bits. We were looking at the new characters and everything, and we're super excited to play this one. It's got tremendous replay value anyway, the base game, but with all the expansion stuff, I've got boxes and boxes of it down here. I'm really looking forward to playing this one. That uh, is a game you do like a lot. Um, you've got a big pile of, like, it's like five boxes <laughs> yeah. down on the floor over there um, that some of them haven't even been opened yet. Yeah. Um, but yeah. I've played the base game a few times with you actually, all yeah. the way through into the longest length of it. It's really good. Um, my favourite thing about it is just the character levelling and building, just the, the way the dice work. It's fantastic, it's original, and it works really well. Uh, mine, Mark actually guessed before when Jonathan <laughs> said, Here's the topic we're going to do. Mark picked mine out of, uh, of uh, you know, of in thin air, effectively. Yes, mine's Tear to Wacken. Uh, it oh. is the successor to Tolkien, effectively. The guy, one of the designers of Tolkien, does this. We played it at the expo, it's effectively, uh, it's uh, tons of information on the board, but the action's really simple, you're basically moving your dice around in a rondelle, but you've got more than one dice you can move, it's a bit like a game Versailles that we have in the cafe, um, and your actions get more powered up based on how many dice you've got there, and the values on your dice also power up the actions. Um, we played a third of a game at the expo. Uh, it was, it was. I was just in, enthralled throughout. I wish I could have uh, sat there for another two hours, but they kind of uh, they wanted to demo to more people. Um, but these guys joined me, and I uh, hope hopefully you'll be looking forward to it too. Oh yeah, yep, definitely. had a really great time with it. It um, the artwork was quite pale. It still I wasn't. The, it wasn't the finished version. It was yeah. printed A4 rather than a, a real board. I think the artwork's not changed hugely, but it'll be slightly more colourful than. I'm wondering if that. they improved the components a bit. Yeah. I know certainly the little tiles in the middle were proper yeah. like ceramic tiles or yeah. something. So but you had they had a demo of one of the actual tiles that were going to be in the game. Didn't oh they? right, that yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I just like the fact that there's going to be so many options, all these modular different bits, you can modular scoring tracks, different... Yeah, that was nice. Temple tracks, any game with temple <laughs> tracks or cult tracks is a, is a game for me. And it's nice the way that it builds up in the middle, isn't it? You're kind of building, You're building a, a pyramid or a yeah, temple, yeah, yeah. 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 So that was great. All right, uh, well, thanks very much for watching. That was our hotness. <laughs>Everybody, even Steven here, back for another promo contest today. So I'm going to show you some different promos for different board games. And you have to tell me what games do you think those promos are for. You're going to email me at evenstevens2cents at gmail.com with your answers. Whoever gets the most correct will win those promos free of charge. Let's get to it and see how much you know.
Okay, everyone, best of luck in the contest. Remember to email me below. I'll reach out to you if you get the most answers. We'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. Happy lunch time everybody, hope it's scrumptious. Yep, sorry I wasn't there on the last token punch lunch. I've got to negotiate uh, moving to a different job as well as preparing for Essen at this point. So let's just say my life's got a little bit busy as of late, not to mention trying to develop my channel into season three by the end of the year. So back with the tips for teaching games to new people. Well, this time a little bit different from the last two I found. This one I am titling, find an appealable theme or find a theme that's appealing, whatever way you want to phrase it. Now the reason for this is, I know there's a lot of people out there that are like, well, I don't care about theme, I just like mechanics, but I am a big lover of theme. I want theme in my games and I want it to be rich, engaging and immersive. Now why does, why does this matter for teaching new games? Well think about it. Most of these people you're teaching games to have never seen a modern board game before. So you've got to try and pitch this to them in the best way possible, in something that sounds exciting. So which sounds more exciting? Uh, let's find a, an example here. I mean, um, yeah, okay. There's Dream Home. And then I'm gonna find something else. Uh, da, 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 da. Come on, hurry up. Uh, that's all, that'll do. Right, both of these are great games. Both of these are great for new players. However, which one of these do you think is easier for me to sell to someone else in terms of giving them a pitch? The game where you get to build your own house, you get to kit out your rooms with any lots of little decors like paintings and knights in shining armor, build up your house, get a roof, find helpers, you know, build the home you want to live in. Gather a bunch of mosaic tiles and build a mosaic wall. Which one sounded better? Now I know, granted, you could probably come up with better pictures than I could for both of those, but think of this. A, a nice engrossing theme is going to attract more players. Another great example, um, Downforce and Formula D versus Snow Tails. I like all three of those games, or maybe not Formula D as much, but all racing games. Which one do you think was easier for me to get to the table and actually got to the table last time I was down at Dice Portsmouth? Snow Tails. Snow Tails, I had to describe both games as racing, but one's Formula One racing, the other one, Snow Husky Dog Sled Racing. Which one do you think instantly got more votes? Husky Dogs, of course. I mean, more and more people are gonna say Husky Dog Sledding versus Formula One racing. Not to say that Formula One is boring, although I'm not a fan, but it's, you know, it's gonna to appeal to more people. And that's what I'm getting at. You know, if you want to teach games to new players who have never seen this stuff before, you are gonna do so much better teaching them a thematic engaging game than you are teaching some bone dry Euro mechanical game. Granted, you can move them up to that sort of thing, you know, make that the next step or make that maybe a, a game further down the line. But certainly to begin with, you should really just consider finding the most thematic engaging game so that they can go, oh wow, they, this is much better than those uh, things I played in the 80s because how thematic is Monopoly? That's what they're used to, it's what they've probably only played. So find them something where the theme is rich and then they can move on to other thematic greatness like Colosseum and Pursuit of Happiness and uh, um, Sheriff of Nottingham's a fairly, you know, Sheriff of Nottingham would be a good gateway thematic one, you know, for example. Uh, trying to think of others. Um, come on, uh, well, Mysterium, that works well for new gamers and you get that theme of the psychic detectives and the Dixit cards, that's really cool. Uh, Takinoko, you know, great sort of gateway game, but yeah, Takinoko and Takedo. The themes in that are really nice. You know, it doesn't necessarily have to be so rich and dripping in theme, but the theme should appeal. They look at Takedo and ja Takinoko and they go, ooh, that's a very nice Japanese theme. Yeah, I'd like to try that. So that's what I'm getting at. Find a theme that appeals to the majority of players or pretty much anybody. Whew, somebody in my eye. Right, so that's it from me for this episode of the Starting Tile on Token Punch Lunch. Normal service will resume, so yeah, sorry for the break. By the time another episode comes out, I should hopefully have uh, secured a new job and got over Essen. So 
you know, like I say, it's a busy life for a content creator. So take care, enjoy whatever you're eating, and I'll see you on the next starting towel. And remember, as always, it's only a game. Take care, and see you soon. And so that just about wraps up another Token Punch Lunch. I certainly hope that you have uh, enjoyed all of the different segments that uh, we have uh, put together for you. I hope you found them informative. But uh, at the same time, we want to enjoy. Uh, we want you to enjoy the time you spend here as well. There is an entertainment factor there. Uh, so uh, be f feel free to uh, let us know in the comments what you think about the different segments. Contact the segment, segment contributors themselves uh, through that comment section. Let them know what you like or dislike. But hey, be nice about it. Be constructive. Uh, but at the same time, we want to hear from you. Hear what you think. So that's it for another episode of Token Punch Lunch. I want to thank you guys for joining us. We certainly appreciate it, uh, taking the time to view the content that we provide for you. Take care, and we'll see you guys and gals on the flip side. Fatality.